have class number one of understanding the transatlantic slave trade where they didn't teach you in school ancient kemet the moors and the maafa understand the transatlantic slave trade uh starting up sunday uh starts up sunday 12 noon to 2 p.m 10 week online course we do a thousands of years of history and what led up to the transatlantic slave trade taking place also okay and i do a powerpoint presentation we have uh book references articles video clips guest speakers we have a ton of um information here okay and we deal with uh ancient africa we deal with uh nubia tana hesse ethiopia uh ancient kemet ancient egypt uh we deal with uh some of the understanding some of the mythology and uh netters and the stories of Asar, Aset, and Heru, who the Greeks called Osiris, Isis, and Horus. Um, so we take you through our history, take you through our, the chronology of history, so we can see what leads up to the transatlantic slave trade taking place, okay? Um, we deal with Aset, and we deal with the um, how Europeans in Europe were worshiping the Black Madonna and Child before, even before the Moors go in in 711 AD. And as you have a rise of European powers coming out of the Dark Ages, you're going to have a rise of the European phenotype as well. And you're going to have uh, these images that were African reinterpreted as European. We talk about uh, Dr. David M. Hotel's book, The First Americans Were Africans, Documented Evidence, and the African presence in the Americas dating back at least 51,700 years ago. We've had him speak to our class before. Uh, as well, and I've interviewed him a number of times. We know page 14 of his book, The First Americans Were Africans, Documented Evidence, deals with the discovery from Dr. Albert Goodyear in 2004 in Allendale County, South Carolina, where they discovered uh, 13 different types of evidence that thoroughly documents an African presence in the land we call the United States of America, dating back at least 51,700 years ago. And they found uh, artifacts, architecture, campsites, carvings, uh, Egyptian writings, footprints and lava, genetic M174 D haploid groups dealing with DNA and genetics, linguistics, uh, paintings, skulls, skeletons, structures, and tools. And uh, 13 different types of evidence uh, fairly documented in African presence in this country going back at least 51,700 years ago. And this was the Khoisan. The Khoisan, um, who have the oldest DNA on the planet, of the ancestors to the Ainu and the Twa. They go all around the world and they were here. Uh, this article from uh, 2004, November 18, 2004, by Dr. Albert Goodyear, well, it's about the discovery by Dr. Albert Goodyear. Um, it's called New Evidence Puts Man in North America 50,000 Years Ago. Here's a picture of Dr. Albert Goodyear. He's a white uh, archaeologist. And a summary from ScienceDaily.com, which is a scientific journal, scientific website. They have scientific discoveries, archaeological discoveries. It says radiocarbon tests of carbonized plant remains where artifacts were unearthed last May along the Savannah River in Allendale County by University of South Carolina archaeologist uh, Dr. Albert Goodyear indicate that the sediments containing these artifacts are at least 50,000 years old, meaning that humans inhabited North America long before the last ice age. OK, so who were these humans? This is before Native Americans even come into existence. OK, this is before Europeans are on the face of the earth. All right. So we do our archaeological discoveries that are causing uh, scientists and paleontologists to rethink everything like this one here that deals with stone tools found on the Greek island of Crete uh, that date back 130,000 years ago. And Crete has been an island for more than five million years. And uh, this is from New York Times, uh, February 15th, 2010, on, on Crete, new evidence of very ancient mariners. So it says that um, it, uh, this discovery seems to push back Mediterranean voyaging back more than 100,000 years. Uh, and previous to this discovery, um, seafaring in the Mediterranean, uh, they, they thought dated back only 10,000 to 12,000 years ago. But this seems to push that back at least 100,000 years. Um, we deal with things like the lost city of Tanis Heraklion, the lost city of Egypt. And this discovery was revealed in April 2013 
by Frank Gaudio and his his team is believed Thomas Heraklion was built around 8th century BC, but it was swallowed into the sea. So in this discovery, they show what they found at, at, at the bottom of the sea. They found 16 foot tall statues, 700 acres, 700 anchors, countless gold coins, 64 ships uh, down there at the, uh, the uh, beneath the surface of Egypt's Bay of Abukir. This was a big discovery. Um, I read a lot about this when this came out in uh, 2013. I actually has some footage of them underneath the water. These, these are some of the discoveries that they made underneath the water. So then we did with uh, Freemasonry and how it has its origins coming out of ancient Kemet as well. But some of the things we deal with in the class, this 10 week online class on this uh, ancient Kemet, the Moors and the Ma'afa, understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what it didn't teach you in school. Um, it, we do what was the transatlantic slave trade? What were some events that led up to it ha happening? And we actually deal with a chronology of history and go back thousands of years and show how different events are connected. What role did Christopher Columbus play? Because Columbus was central to uh, laying the foundation for slavery, racism, capitalism, and the exploitation of indigenous people, even though the transatlantic slave trade goes back to 1441 with uh, the Portuguese going into Mauritania. Okay. Um, but Columbus is really going to help spread that with his four voyages and conquering uh, Jamaica and Haiti, Puerto Rico, Honduras, Panama, things like this. His four voyages from 1492 to uh, 1504. And we know that uh, Haiti's been in the news in the past few months. Haiti, Cuba and Jamaica, these were all islands that Columbus conquered on behalf of Spain a little more than 500 years ago. And these islands these nations are still feeling the effects of what happened a little more than 500 years ago in Spain conquering these islands. We know that uh, the western portion of Hispaniola, uh, where Haiti and Saint Domin uh, 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 Saint Dom uh, the Haiti and the Dominican Republic, Republic are today, um, we know the western portion was um, the colony that the French called Saint Dominique, and the French are going to take Saint uh, take Saint Dominique from the Spanish is originally going to be conquered by the Spanish. Okay. So we take you through this history. Um, we look at when did Africans first come to the U S as slaves. And even before 1619, you know, the Spanish were taking Africans into the territory we call South Carolina, that South Carolina, Georgia area in 1526. These Africans are going to rise up after a few weeks and overthrow their oppressors and disappear. It's believed they went to live with uh, Native Americans. Did Africans sell themselves into slavery? We did with that complicated history. Um, were African people in America before the transatlantic slave trade? Yeah, we were. African people are the original Americans. We were here. We were here in this land before anybody else was here. Now, that doesn't mean the transatlantic slave trade didn't didn't happen. Yeah, it did. It just happened thousands of years uh, later. That's all. That's why you have to understand the chronology of history. The transatlantic slave trade happened. It just happened thousands of years later. But no, this was this was our land stolen from us. I and mean, it's been stolen multiple times. Because the Louisiana Purchase of 1803, where France sells 828,000 square miles of land to the U.S., France had no authority to sell that land. That land was owned by Native Americans and African people who were here. France had no authority to sell that land. So you have one thief selling the land to another thief. Um, so we deal with uh, where African people in America is before the transatlantic slave trade, the 800 year occupation of Europe by the Africans known as the Moors. And what the Moors take into Europe, the Moors are taking the teachings coming out of the Nile Valley region of Africa, especially ancient Kemet. They're taking these teachings into Europe. This is going to bring Europe out of the dark ages. They're introducing new surgical techniques. They're introducing new foods and musical instruments. Um, they're introducing uh, new types of weapons, uh, the periodic tables, what they call alchemy. Today, we call it chemistry. They're introducing the periodic tables and all different types of things like this. Different. Uh, they're introducing art and architecture. They help civilize Europeans. All this came back to kick us in the behind. And this is why I say I wish we had never taught them. And really, when you understand the, the chronology of this history, the transatlantic slave trade is really Europeans getting revenge on the African Moors for what happened in Europe. The transatlantic slave trade didn't just fall out of the sky. 
the, the Portuguese are the first ones involved in about 1441. They dominate for the first 200 years. Spain and Portugal is where the Moors are going right into, which is right above Morocco. The, the Portuguese were the first ones involved in the transatlantic slave trade. The Spanish are going to be next. And the Moors are changing the complexion of Europe to various extents, especially in Spain and Portugal, because they're intermixing into the European population. OK, uh, so we deal with uh, shocking archaeological discoveries that are causing experts to rethink everything. The role insurance companies uh, played as well, because insurance companies took on insurance policies on slave ships and enslaved Africans on plantations. Freemasonry, America and the founding fathers, origins of the term America and Africa. Uh, we do a lot. You know, the bubonic plague, the Black Death it hits and spurts from 1347 to 1400. Europe is going to lose between a quarter to a third of their population, somewhere between 25 million to 75 million people over the course of uh, decades based upon uh, attributed to the bubonic plague, the Black Death. Um, we talk about Mansa Musa. We talk about Ghana, Songhai and Mali connection between Mansa Musa and T'Challa in the film Black Panther. Uh, T'Challa is the richest man in the Marvel comic universe. We know Mansa Musa was the uh, richest man in the history of the world, became emperor of the Mali Empire, 1312 A.D. So we talk about ancient Kemet and the Netter. And, and we deal with the film Black Panther and show how the film Black Panther relates to African history, African culture, African language, spiritual systems. We know the Panther deity Bast in Black Panther comes from Bastet, the uh, uh, the cat in ancient Kemet, who was a netter. Um, ancient Egyptian goddess worshipped in the form of a lioness and later a cat. And uh, Bastet was the uh, netter of warfare in lower Kemet, Lower Egypt, worshipped as early as the Second Dynasty, uh, uh, 2890 BCE, before the Common Era. Uh, we do it with the word Wakanda means, because uh, Wakanda is a real word. We find it in the Omaha Ponca language, Sioux Indian language. It's also uh, in Key Congo. It's a Bantu uh, word as well. Uh, Wakanda means possesses secret powers. We deal with Columbus and where Columbus went on his four voyages. We just go cr uh, chronologically throughout history. And Columbus never came to the land that we call the United States of America. Um, the closest Columbus came here was Cuba, which is about 90 miles away. And this is where he went on his four voyages. He goes into the Bahamas, Cuba, Hispaniola, was Haiti and, and, and Dominican Republic. That's in 1492. Third voyage. Um, September 1493 he goes into the West Indies. He goes into Puerto Rico and Jamaica. Okay, in 1494, uh, third voyage, uh, so that's second voyage. Third voyage, May 1498, it goes into Trinidad and the, uh, Trinidad and Venezuelan mainland uh, in South America. Uh, fourth voyage, May 1504, it goes into Panama and Honduras in Central America. Okay, he, he never comes to the land we call the United States of America, but we still feel the effects of Columbus conquering those territories, those, those islands, on behalf of the Spanish crown. King Ferdinand and uh, Queen Isabella. Um, so those are just a few of the things that we deal with. Uh, we talk about the fake Willie Lynch letter, 1712 also, because Willie Lynch never historically existed. We should throw that in the garbage can. Okay, so those are just a few of the things that we deal with in the 10-week online course, all right? So if any of that interests you, um, be sure to register for the class. We do the sessions live. All the sessions are archived, recorded. You can go back and watch them anytime. Now, you can see me in the class. I can't see you. It's not like a Zoom call at work. And you can see everybody there, right? It's not like that. Uh, so you don't have to worry about, you know, you can be in your pajamas if you want to. You can have a bonnet on or what have you. Um, we have a lot of text chat in the class. So you can ask questions also. So the course is regularly $130. It's on sale $80. And you have access to the class even after the course is over with you can go back and watch the whole thing so next year if you want to watch the full 10-week class that's fine and since it's archived you don't have to worry about being in class at a certain time so I teach this one the second class i teach meets on saturdays 12 noon to 2 p.m from the civil war to the civil rights movement and black power 1865 to 1968 this class basically picks up 
where understanding the transatlantic slave trade leads off. Okay. So we deal with the civil war, 1861, 1865, and some events that lead up to the civil war taking place. The Louisiana purchase of 1803, the, um, Texas when its independence in 1836, Texas becoming the state in the union, 1845, Mexican American war, 1845, 1846, treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo of 1848 that ends the Mexican American war. Out of the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, the U.S. is going to get the uh, land that makes up California, Arizona, New Mexico, Colorado, Utah, and Nevada. They get all this land. Uh, um, Mexico loses about a third of their of their territory, and the U.S. gets all this land. And then you're going to have to organize this land and determine which uh, uh, territories are going to have slavery, which are not, things like this. So you have the Compromise of 1850. And the Compromise of 1850 consists of five bills, and some of that has to do with organizing uh, that new land uh, coming from the uh, uh, the comp uh, coming from the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo. But the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850 is one of the bills that's part of the Compromise of 1850, and the Fugitive Slave Act intensifies the abolitionist movement makes it more dangerous for runaway slaves who run into the north and causes more of them to go into canada okay and the compromise of 1850 is a result of the uh is a consequence of the mexican mexican american war of 1846 to 1848 then you have the um kansas nebraska act of 1840 uh the kansas nebraska act of 1854 Kansas Nebraska Act of 1854 is going to uh, leave up to those people moving into that new territory of Kansas and Nebraska to determine whether or not they want to have slavery. OK, um, as opposed to uh, it being dictated to them by the federal government. OK, they, they have popular sovereignty. So the Kansas Nebraska Act of 1854 is going to lead to uh a uh, conflict called uh, Bleeding Kansas, okay? Bleeding Kansas. Bleeding Kansas was armed conflict between pro-slavery groups and anti-slavery groups, uh, pro-slavery groups and anti-slavery groups in Kansas. And there is going to be armed conflict between these groups from about um, 1855 to about 1859, okay? That's... that's uh, called Bleeding Kansas. Now, as a result of the Kansas-Nebraska Act of 1854, you're going to have the Republican Party founded in 1854 as a direct backlash. And the Republican Party was organized by groups of abolitionists. And you're going to have people who are, uh, some people who were members of the Whig Party, W-H-I-G, which is a, a, pre, a, a political party that existed before the Republican Party, they're, they're founded around 1834, the Whig Party. And the Whig Party's dying out, so you're going to have some of those members who helped to form the Republican Party to be the counter to the Democratic Party. Contrary to popular belief, the Democratic Party did not create slavery. I hear people saying, I don't know where the hell y'all got that from. Um, Democratic Party wasn't founded in 1828. So for the majority of the time slavery existed in this country, you didn't have a Democratic Party or a Republican Party. Uh, I've heard people calling the radio show saying Democrats created slavery. I'm like, please cite your evidence for that. That's not true at all. Um, so we deal with history leading up to the Civil War and then deal with Civil War, Reconstruction, 1865, 1877, Compromise of 1877, which uh, ends... Uh, reconstruction. We deal with the the, the uh, failing of the uh, Freedmen's Bank in 1874. Uh, we deal with the Freedmen's Bureau being shut down as well. And when the when the Freedmen's Bank collapses in 1874, we lose 2.9 million dollars in deposits in the Freedmen's Bank. We we still haven't recovered from the Freedmen's Bank failing, and even the Freedmen's Bureau, Freedmen's Bureau was poorly managed. It wasn't properly funded. Uh, it should have lasted longer. Uh, it was created in March 1865 by act of Congress. 
the free i mean if you're enslaved for 246 years you should have help for more than like a decade or so you should you should have a bureau to address those issues for decades at least 100 years or something um so we take you throughout that history then we did the jim crow era and we look at the uh, we look at the attempt to uh by white supremacists here's sarah rector Sarah Rector became the richest Afro-American girl in the country in the early 1900s, right around 1912, 1913. And her family was, uh, uh, she was of uh, enslaved Creek Indian ancestry, okay? So after slavery ends, because of the Black Freedmen Indian Treaties of 1866 and the Dawes Allotment Act of 1887, her family gets land. Oil is discovered on her land allotment and she becomes a millionaire. Sarah Rector, R-E-C-T-O-R. -E so we deal with, we, we also show the, the laws and policies that were put in place um, after Reconstruction ends as well. Uh, the Ku Klux Klan Act of 1871 was crucial as extremely important uh, because President Ulysses S. Grant declares martial law. Um, he declares martial law in nine counties in South Carolina to crack down on the Ku Klux Klan in October of 1871. Uh, let's see here. Okay, so we deal with different massacres that take place, Colfax Massacre, your Yafala Massacre in Alabama, um, uh, Vicksburg, Mississippi uh, Massacre as well, 1874, all, all these massacres. But we deal with how uh, also the laws and policies put in place to take back control of political office in the South, take back control of the uh, state legislatures, okay? Like the Mississippi Plan of 1890, okay? The Mississippi Plan of 1890, where the Mississippi State Convention um, meets and uh, the, the judge that is presiding over the Mississippi State Convention he says, we are here to exclude the Negro. His name was Judge Solomon Saladin Calhoun. He said, we are here to exclude the Negro because African-Americans were the majority population in Mississippi. OK. And we were electing people in the office. We were electing African-Americans in the office. And what you're going to have is this uh, attempt by these white supremacists to pass laws to suppress the African-American vote, just like they're doing. Uh, now Republicans in, in uh, 49 state legislatures have over 400 bills proposed. And they've already passed bills in Texas and in Georgia. The same thing happened after Reconstruction ended. And Mississippi, what Mississippi did was known as the Mississippi Plan. And that became the model that other Southern states adopted, South Carolina, 1895, Louis Louisiana, 1898, Alabama 1901. But if you go, if you look at poll taxes, Florida was the state that had the first poll taxes in 1889. That's a year before the Mississippi State uh, Convention. And at these state conventions, what they're doing is rewriting the state constitution. And they're writing into the state constitution poll taxes and literacy tests to lock African Americans out of voting, greatly reduce the number of African Americans who can vote. And in some cases, like in Louisiana, they're also instituting uh, property ownership requirements to be able to vote as well. At the, at the 1890 Mississippi State Convention, a new constitution was adopted that included a literacy test and poll tax for eligible voters. Under the new literacy test requirement, a potential voter had to be able to read any section of the Mississippi State Constitution or understand any section when read to him or give a reasonable interpretation of any section of the Mississippi State Constitution. Now, a lot of times, the white person that you're talking about, the registrar, a lot of times they were illiterate. If you watch Eyes on the Prize, if you watch Eyes on the, the original Eyes on the Prize that dealt with from 1955 with the lynching of Emmett Till, August 28, 1955, through the signing of the Voting Rights Act, 1965. They talk about the Mississippi State Constitution and the literacy tests. Okay, 
And this is one of the reasons why you needed a voting rights after 1965 to strike all that down and make all that illegal. These were obstacles to the 15th Amendment that were being passed after Reconstruction ends in 1877 to specifically design to suppress the African-American vote and lock us out of as much as possible out of voting and prevent African-Americans from being elected into public office. Because during Reconstruction, there were about 2,000 African-Americans who got elected into public office. In South Carolina, the majority of the state legislature were African-American men in uh, during Reconstruction. James Vardaman in 1890, who served in the Mississippi state legislature, said there is no use to equivocate or lie about the matter. OK, um, it, 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 referring to the Mississippi State uh, Convention, he said, quote, in Mississippi, we have in our Constitution legislated against the racial uh peculiarities of the negro when that device fails we will resort to something else end quote this was specifically they're specifically writing laws to suppress the african-american vote so they can fully take back control of these political offices and state legislatures in the south the impact of the legislation was swift by 1910 registered voters among african-americans dropped to 15 percent in virginia and under 2% in both Alabama and Mississippi. According to historian Donald G. Nyman in his book, Promises to Keep African-Americans in the Constitutional Order, 1776 to the Present. Um, read this piece here from history.com, how Jim Crow era laws suppress the African-American vote for generations. Okay, so we take you through the Jim Crow era, we take you through World War I, World War II, Great Migration, 1915 to 1970, Six million African Americans migrate out the South, up North and out West. Civil rights movement and Black Power movement. Okay, uh, so that class. Now you can take the classes in any order. You can take both of them at the same time if you want to. But the second class, from the Civil War to the Civil Rights Movement and Black Power, eighteen sixty five to nineteen sixty eight. This class basically picks up where understanding the transatlantic slave trade leaves off because I had so much information. Um, I couldn't get all of it into understanding the transatlantic slave trade. And this 100 plus year period of history is crucial. So each class we go through and analyze approximately a 100 year period of history or maybe a little more than 100 years to understand what happened to us after slavery ended. What were the laws and policies put in place and to put us in a predicament we're in right now so we understand where we go from here. And when we, when we understand this history that happened, after Reconstruction ended, you see this history repeating itself. You see the these cycles uh, repeating themselves. So we have to understand this history so we can keep this cycle from happening again. Okay, a people's history and culture teaches them how to deal with the problems of the past, in the present, and the future to meet the needs of the community, but also so we don't keep making the same mistakes as well. OK, so you can register for this class. Now, this one here is on sale for a very limited time, only seventy dollars, regularly one hundred thirty dollars. And we do the sessions live. All the sessions are archived as well from the Civil War to the Civil Rights Movement and Black Power, 1865 to 1968. Uh, we posted the links here, but it's also at AfricanHistoryNetwork.com right on the home page. So just scroll down. You'll see information about the radio show. We have a cell, uh, African history network.com also, um, current promotion at 20% off, uh, DVD lectures and downloads, uh, orders of a hundred dollars or more use promo code eight, eight, 10, 20 off 2021. Okay. That's going through the weekend. Um, you scroll down and you see the information for the, uh, classes Just click on register here. It takes you to the next page and uh, click on enroll. As soon as you enroll, you can start watching the content. You can join us in class. Okay. Uh, and if you have if you have any questions or um, need any special accommodations as well, you can email us at ahnshow at africanhistorynetwork.com, ahnshow at africanhistorynetwork.com. Um, we'll try to accommodate you. Also, if you want to pay through PayPal, we can uh, set that up as well. All right. We have to get out of here. Remember, at the African History Network, we focus on educating, empowering, and inspiring people. 
for African descent throughout the diaspora and around the world because right now it's correct wrong behavior. It's not over till we win with Connor forever. We'll be, we'll be back um, uh, Sunday. We're on for two hours on Sunday, 9 p.m. to 11 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Remember, right now it's correct wrong behavior. It's not over till we win with Connor forever. And we'll talk to you next time.